Well, hello there, YouTube, and welcome to the continuation of this Bugaro Master Study. So, today we are going to start to add skin tones to this painting, and I will guide you along my thought process with the skin tones. We're going to keep it uh, relatively simple, but we're going to use some colors that are probably a little more complicated than you're used to. But then I'll talk about why you can use pretty much almost anything that you want to as long as you're following the properties of oil painting uh, the fundamental properties of oil painting such as fat over lean and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, the colors that are on my palette are burnt sienna alizarin crimson actually this is alizarin permanent uh, windsor red which i usually have cadmium red but i'm just using windsor red right now uh, cadmium orange uh, not cadmium orange uh, this is orange molybdate which is cadmium scarlet it is like cadmium scarlet it's a fiery red orange this is just cadmium orange indian yellow yellow ochre cadmium yellow which mine is actually chrome yellow <clears throat> excuse me chrome yellow which is a um, uh, lead version of cadmium yellow it's what we used to use before cadmium yellow uh, fun fact, from what I heard, um, it is the yellow paint that Van Gogh used to eat, so that's kind of an uh, interesting fun fact. Lead tin yellow, cadmium green, sap green, cerulean blue, phthalo turquoise, ultramarine blue, and dioxazine purple. Now we started this underpainting with, um, with just raw umber, and... Um, raw umber and lead white uh, a while ago it's been probably more than a week now since i worked on uh, this painting so uh, what i'm going to do now is just guide you through a very simple uh, mixture so i'm going to go with something you wouldn't normally see and that's going to be straight up red so this would be like your cadmium red like a fiery red and cadmium green so you can go cadmium red cadmium green now depending on your cadmium green uh this one is Winsor newton uh it can be a little transparent so you'll need more of the cadmium green as you've seen here so this is going to create a very odd color once you add white to it so on the top here, I have lead white, this, and this is lead white. This is reused lead white from a previous painting session. Uh, and this is a, a new little dab of lead white. And um, this is titanium white, which I've been messing around with. I guess I'll use some of the titanium white. And this creates a nice and yellow ochre-ish color. So if you look at this... This is pretty much a diluted version of yellow ochre. You could have just gone with yellow ochre and white. That's what I'm saying. You can use pretty much anything you want to as long as you know your uh, basic color wheel. By your color wheel, I mean know your complementary uh, colors, starting with red and green. So red and green are complementary colors. What complementary colors will do, like yellow and purple or blue and orange, usually I actually go for blue and orange first, um, is that they neutralize each other. And uh, in that struggle between two strong colors, they will come to an agreement in a kind of uh, diluted brown, which is close to uh, natural skin tone, which is pretty neat. So now we're going to just test this out. And now we're going to see that's pretty skin tone-ish. Um, I added actually a touch of blue. I didn't even mention what that was. That was cerulean blue just because I knew that this was going a little bit too warm. So now we're going to talk about... Um, first we'll talk about the layering process with this painting. Because it's a Bouguereau. Bouguereau is a very complicated uh, master study to do. So trying to do a picture perfect finish in one go with color is not a good idea so what you want to do is you want to think about this in small increments 
So by small increments, I mean you're going to want to go from one square inch to another square inch, making the values lighter than they ultimately are going to go. So I'm actually going to go with titanium white. In the past, I really didn't like using titanium white. But these days, I'm just kind of like, whatever. Um, I mess around with titanium white. The problem with titanium white is a little bit goes too far sometimes whereas you're usually more safe using um, lead white so this is probably a little more orange than I want it to be so think about your color wheel now I actually mentioned the complement of orange earlier and I'm sure you know what the complement of orange is um, so I'm going to go with, of course, a blue, but I'm not going to go with cerulean blue. I'm going to go with ultramarine blue. A little bit of ultramarine blue. And of course, I'm going to keep diluting this. The ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, which if you saw uh, the video I uploaded, I don't know, two weeks ago, three most useful colors to use for skin tones. That was it, burnt sienna. Oops, there goes my reference. Burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, and white. And that's pretty pretty nice. That's a color that I would like. And there we go. And that is our first plane change. Now let's talk about another very fundamental concept that is quite important in oil painting. Uh, it's not the most important thing because the most important thing is actually knowing how to draw with color. Um, but we'll get into that, of course, later on. Uh, fat over lean is important because it is the physics of how the oil painting will dry and how archival your painting is archival meaning how long the thing is going to last on this physical planet um, it it depends right if you for example if you're painting on a panel uh, a, a sturdy support like this you're going to have a much higher chance of your painting uh, surviving over the, the decades. If you paint on a stretched surface, it's going to be less likely to survive in the long run. Not saying that it won't, because we have stretched canvases from who knows way back in the day. So um, doesn't mean that your paintings won't last. And I actually prefer to work on a stretched canvas, um, but these panels are much easier for storage and much easier uh, to sell if I if I need to sell uh, a painting so the support remember is the most important thing which is oftentimes not mentioned with fat over lean uh, make sure you have a sturdy support and if you have a stretched canvas uh, make sure that it is a linen canvas because linens tend to have a longer shelf life let's just say uh, than cotton canvases now I'm going to go with the dark of the hairline because you need to have something to contrast the skin tone or else the skin tone is going to look incorrect relative to um, everything around it. And yes, I'm aware that that is a tad bit too orangey, but we were having fun with the red and cadmium green. Would I actually do that? Probably not. I probably would have just went with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. I just wanted to show you... Uh, bizarre way to create a skin tone um, not that practical uh, so anyway uh, I'm gonna mix up the dark for the hair I'm gonna go with uh, ultramarine blue alizarin sap green alright so back to the topic of fat over lean Here's the complicated stuff, the stuff that you probably already know, or if you don't know, then uh, you will know after this video. Uh, use less, little to no medium 
for your first couple layers and then you gradually introduce medium that's it gradually introduce medium as you add more layers of oil paint and for you to follow the traditional fat over lean you when i say medium this paint already has medium in it and that's a linseed oil unless you have paint that has walnut oil or something else which forget about it uh just linseed oil um this already has medium in it so you need to consider that okay so this is us using little medium because we can't use no medium there is medium in the oil paint so nothing but solvent what i'm using to thin out the paint for the second layer is solvent on the third layer uh, we can introduce a medium which could be a linseed oil mixture which is um, just use linseed oil mixed uh, half and half um, not with your coffee half and half with um, solvent whichever solvent you want um, if you want to use turpentine go ahead if you want to use um, odorless mineral spirits that's fine um, I like to mix my linseed oil with spike lavender oil which is a solvent you can treat it like a medium if you want to in that sense but really all it does um, from my understanding is it breaks down uh, and thins the paint out just like um, your odorless mineral spirits or your turpentine wood or you can go another direction uh, you could use faster drying mediums early earlier on in the in the painting and then you gradually introduce slow dryers and here's the reason for fat over lean because there's always a reason for something we don't just come up with these rules and say you must follow them uh, or else um, there's a reason for it and that's the drying time the drying time for fat over lean is why you say use less oil earlier on because traditionally medium would slow down the drying time and it would also of course it affects the film like the, the strength of the paint film um, but really uh, it's the drying time that you want to focus on um, for example you do not want to have a slow dry slow drying layer and then add a fast drying layer over top of that it's not a good idea um, because what happens is if the layer underneath starts to dry before the layer uh, or if the layer underneath does not dry thoroughly and then you add a layer over top of that that dries really fast like really really fast that's when you start to have problems that's when pretty much paintings start to crack and form little bubbles and things that you don't want which in my experience I've never actually seen uh, except for one time I've seen one painting uh, in my lifetime uh, a painting that was done in my lifetime that started to crack it wasn't done by me <laughs> thankfully but I've seen it uh, and I think it's because I'm not gonna mention who did it but the artist that uh, did it started with stand oil as their medium and that was it just started with stand oil and then uh, that's just too slow of a dryer to use in the beginning so I'm quickly getting this uh, contour and then another thing I should mention now that we've spoken what has it been like 14 minutes now we've spoken a lot about color and fat over lean what about the actual painting process like what, what am i doing here what am i trying to get done today i'll tell you one thing i'm not trying to do and that is i'm not trying to 
finish this in one fell swoop of color uh this is not a good idea especially with a portrait and my channel my youtube channel specializes in portraiture uh that's just like my favorite thing in the world i love painting people i don't know why i, th I just find it really fascinating to represent humans in this abstract sense um what we're looking for is a building process. What can I get done today that will make my painting session the next day uh, go a lot more smooth? So one thing drawing wise, noticing that the angle of the neck is completely wrong. So this needs to actually almost go straight. And I'm just going in with color because I'm trying to fix things. The color is going to be really simple. It's not going to be as complicated as the original painting. I would just scrub some of that color in there. While we're at it, the jaw is a little wider. So, like I said, this is an easygoing process, as classical art should be a building process even more simple than this, actually, because the traditional way, uh, is, which, which is how I teach for my online students um, in Project 2, I call it the first project that I recommend uh, students do. You do a full transfer drawing, and then you transfer the drawing and then you uh, underpaint it using the poster image like this and then you build up that underpainting more carefully than this and then you start to add the values but uh, we're going at a different pace because this is not the first lesson for my online students but like I said online students please Feel free to paint along with these YouTube videos. Um, you can definitely send these images to me for your weekly virtual classroom. And anyway, um, I'm moving the ear down. I'm just correcting things with the drawing. Like I said, what I'm trying to do is get something established here that I can build upon later and that answer to that question it varies with different artists so for example uh, I'm trying to with color look for um, things that I missed with value alone because color actually allows you just like value does if you're working with just one dimension if you're just working with um if you're just working with lines think about it as like one dimension and uh, you don't really see things as clearly the mistakes aren't right in your face um, like they are if you're working in two dimensions with light and shadow uh, light and shadow which is what we I don't know if you remember this, I kind of remember this, uh, because this underpainting was so hard. Uh, when I started, I was just working with lines for a while, uh, and then I was like, alright, i got to go into shadows, because I just can't see these angles that well, and then that helped me see the angles. So, when you add a new thing, like, if you're working with a line, and then you add value, you start to see more clearly. Uh, if you are working with only light and shade, once you start to put in middle tones, aka values, then it's like, whoa, there's all kinds of things now because it's the, the picture starts to become dimensional. And it's easier to see mistakes when something is dimensional. It's less work for the mind to have to do um, because those gaps are filled optically. Now... That's three dimensions when you start to add value. You start to see more. Oh, we can see in four dimensions, sure. Uh, 
nah, I'm just kidding. But let's just think about color now as the fourth dimension. Ooh, that's spooky now, isn't it? Uh, so if value is the third dimension and color is the fourth dimension with the fourth dimension now the mistakes are really clear i mean especially if you were working with line uh, and then value for a long time once you start to put in color it's like what why didn't i see that sooner now the this is why most painters, including myself, actually like to start out with color. Uh, we'll do a very loose drawing and then just go right into color. But what's the problem with that? There is a problem with that. There's a trade back with everything. Uh, the drawback to starting off with color is that you are juggling it is a juggling act now uh, because you are working with uh, shape value and color all at the same time yes you're gonna get your big shapes much more clear because the mistakes are just gonna be so easy to spot but the problem is even once you spot a mistake you're now worried about oh darn what is that the right color uh, is that the right value? Is it even in the right place? Uh, so that's the problem. You're going to be juggling. And it's fun to actually juggle sometimes um, because everything is up in the air and it's so expressive and so interactive. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just it complicates things a little bit. And uh, that is exactly why I didn't do that with the start of this painting. I didn't start with juggling because I already knew that the one dimensional questions, meaning the lines, the shape, was going to be very complicated. So I was like, you know, I don't have full faith that I'm going to be able to get something started that's going to be well enough for me to be able to continue to push this. And I'm, I'm gonna paint a dark over here, but push it a little bit towards the blue. So using the same puddle, because I'm using a small palette, I actually recommend that you use a larger palette than this. And I don't recommend that you have your uh, palette right next to the painting. Don't do this just because you see me do this. Do this because it's more convenient for you, if it is. Uh, because it is convenient to have this right next to this because I can put my hand down and um, not worry about my hand getting in the paint or things like that. Um, but, but don't do this just because you see me do this. I always prefer to hold my palette and I love to use a wooden palette. I do not like using glass, um, but I do this. I do this for you, okay? I do this for you because I I had way too many complaints about uh, viewers not being able to tell what color I was mixing because I had to use a different camera on the palette and uh, most of you already know the story behind that so I'm doing this for you because I care I want you to be able to see what colors I'm mixing now if I was to have started this ala prima meaning wet on wet this is precisely what I would have started with. I would have started like this, going in with big colors. And for me, it's gonna be easier next time to work on this once I have the big flat colors down and I'm gonna be able to start to go into the, the nitty gritty kind of um, smaller stuff, uh, which I would have liked to do today. Like I said, I mean, you might have benefited from going in and rendering out that eye. And forgetting about all this um, sometimes I do that I will go in to the eye or the nose or the forehead even which is kind of what I thought I was gonna do today and just render the daylight out of it and then next time come back and keep rendering the daylights out of it and then um, then do all this in the end because it, well this is what everyone wants to see uh, everyone wants to see this no one really cares about this uh, but I am getting this done right now 
because I feel like it. I feel like it's it's important to the to the picture, and I know I can go and render the daylights out of things if I need to. Um, and I'm also on a limited time, so I'd rather just get this done and then just smooth sailing. I'm gonna thin out the paint with Gamsol. Um, smooth sailing in the next layer. I'll know exactly what I need to get done in the next layer. So this dark should be a little bit lower. I'm looking at the the picture here, and, and uh, man, that should be a lot lower. So I am going to get my gloves. All right, get my gloves on. And I'm not doing this just because it's lead white. I would do this with, um, if it was, even if this was water mixable oil paints, I would do that. The reason is that I just don't like getting paint on my hands. It's not good for anybody. You will not absorb lead through your skin that easily. It can happen if you decide to finger paint with the lead white. Um, and if you decide to finger paint with the lead white, then there's probably another issue. Um, maybe. I don't know. But, but don't do it. Uh, just, just don't. So I'm looking at the clearance. Uh, I totally messed that angle up, but I don't care. I'm looking at the clearance from top of the ear down to, or the top of the ear down to the bottom of the headdress. That is, by eye, I guess, um, the clearance that is needed for that. And this uh, goes way lower. So I have to actually look at my computer screen. I'm actually monitoring what you're watching on my computer screen. Uh, that's how I'm able to get this uh, webcam, this me camera here. And this is actually the camera that you used to see my palette from. Uh, and uh, of course, that just didn't work. And I'm going to make this background dark a little bit warmer. Throw in a touch of alizarin crimson. All right, so why did I decide to... Oh, man, I cropped this completely weird. I didn't realize that. I think the top... I, I actually cropped it on my reference, too. I think this goes down. I actually don't know. I don't remember. I'm too lazy to go get the reference, the full reference. What you're looking at there is what I'm looking at on my iPad. I actually... I cropped it like that, silly me. But it is a study, it's a master study. The purpose here is to learn. If she ends up looking like she's from the Salem Witch Trials, it's all good. It's still a historical painting. Ubero was a neoclassical painter, so he did not uh, care too much about painting uh, I guess modern time things because during his time uh, Picasso was actually alive during his time and uh, the post-impressionist modernist movement all that stuff was going on around the time or I guess starting around the time Bouguereau was, was uh, painting now I'm gonna have to edit this I gotta think about the vignette now the last thing I want to do is Prop her neck like that uh, because that's just like a blah, butchering her neck. I don't want to do that, um, and I don't want to paint the second model's head here because there is a second model. Um, this is actually a young mother holding a child. Uh, I think that's the title of the painting. So uh, I'm gonna think for a second. And yes, if you're working with lead white. Don't drink anything uh, by grabbing the top of your cup, especially if you're drinking tea or coffee. 
if you accidentally have paint on your hands like I do, I have blue paint on my hands. Notice I'm grabbing my Coke Zero from the bottom. No, this is not sponsored. Um, and this is caffeine free, so, so I don't get the shaky. And with caffeine, grab it from the bottom. It's not going to crawl up to the top and it just, it's not going to do that. Lead doesn't move. Lead doesn't move on its own. So if you get it somewhere, it's going to follow Newtonian physics and it's going to stay there unless it's dripping because it's got something on it, uh, like a medium. If anything, gravity from the condensation of the Coke Zero is going to make it drip down. So I'm not going to be ingesting lead this way. So, um, things that painters say um, versus reality. Okay, so I've decided how I'm going to crop it. I'm going to use this as a line. And I've actually got a timer. I think I've got still, i still got like 28 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, I've got a timer set for me because I, right after this, I'm going to be meeting with my group Zoom students. So if you want to paint with me on Zoom like like this, uh, or I'm painting and I'm working on a studio painting, or we're doing a lesson together, definitely check check out the Zoom tier in the online classes. I have not increased any rates. I know that inflation is crazy everywhere. I have not increased my prices for any of my online classes. All right, this is how I'm going to crop it. Uh, this is going to go here. This is going to go dark. Ta -da. That's how I'm going to crop it. And um, all right, so now is a good time to start to uh, add more to the skin tones. So I'm going to use uh, the same brush that I used for this. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just apply this contour while I still have this mixture obviously I'm not going to render anything look how strong titanium white is there's not that much on the brush in terms of paint I wish I could show you how much paint is on the brush there's hardly anything but it just won't give up it's just like look at that Look at that. That that is insane. I am not used to that. I don't work with titanium white. Look at that. That's just it's just going. I might even have enough for this. Now we're finally starting to lose some paint. Jeez Louise. My goodness. All right. Are you done? Are you done? One of those days I'm just talking to the brush. All right. Um, now I'm going to address this problem because that is just way too orangey yellow for my liking. So what I'm going to do is get the palette knife. And this was just for fun. But uh, let's get serious. Oh, I didn't explain what this was. Uh, that is not a color out of the tube. This is the scrap pile. So this is what I get when I clean off the palette, mix everything, and put it there. Because these days, times are rough. I gotta save every drop, every, <clears throat> every ounce of paint that I can. Times are tough. Um, and even if times aren't tough, Probably a good idea to save on your paint. I just I just like palettes. I like how uh, paint dries on palettes. The patina of palettes, uh, especially wooden palettes. To me, it's a work of art on its own. Now we're addressing this problem right away. So white, 
and uh, cerulean blue because if it went to yellow purple would have been the answer but since there was a bit of orange in it blue was the answer white is actually a coolant you can use white as a coolant so lead white makes it cooler um, So there, that that right there is what we want. Now I'm going to go ahead and just cover some more light. I'm working more opaque. I'm not glazing. I would only glaze, and maybe, maybe last time I thought that I would glaze, uh, but I would only glaze, glaze if I'm fully confident in my underpainting which I'm not back then when we started this I probably thought that I would do another layer in the grisaille maybe I think I said that I don't remember anymore um, but I just wanted to start getting some color on here uh, today but yeah I would only glaze if I was certain of my underpainting because then you can just use it to skip a lot of stuff and just glaze it. I know I've done it before on my YouTube channel, um, admittingly not as cautiously as, as I should have, meaning I shouldn't have done just an underpainting in one sitting and then glazed it. Because who am I to think that I can do a finished underpainting in one sitting? That's crazy. Uh, I have done underpaintings like that and I do that uh, much more carefully uh, in the online classes see now I'm remixing the value for the cheek and yes, I could have could have glazed it and maintained that value underneath, but I just wasn't confident in that value. And uh, the logic goes, the saying goes, if you found it once, you should be able to find it again. If you can't find it again, then it was just luck. And you don't want to go about your painting career by relying on luck. Now here's where I'm going to stop and address the question that you're wondering you might be wondering why are you starting to put values in here whereas you kept this flat and that's just because I'm confident enough that I can make these large planes because this is like flat uh, this is like side flat side again and then reflected light I'm confident enough that I can get this in what like I don't even know how much time I have left okay got, got 20 minutes I can I can deal with this and then I'm probably gonna make everything around it more flat so I'm cooling down the color a little bit Cerulean blue is a very beautiful blue. It's not, it doesn't have the tinting power of cobalt blue or ultramarine blue. Cerulean blue is on the expensive side. Uh, so typically I'll just use ultramarine blue um, and it works fine for this. But if you've got it, I'd recommend you use it. But don't worry too much about 
the color at this point. Only use it like the fourth dimension to be able to help you see things that you may have missed in the first dimension. And it's not as complicated as what other things that use four dimensions like general relativity and making space time all one thing and stuff like that. Um, it's not that complicated. Uh, but it is very complicated. I will admit to you. On YouTube, there's this... Uh, I mean, not just YouTube, but like as an instructor, so I've been teaching for a while now, um, there's this feeling, this need to make things more simple. The quest for simplicity. And sometimes the answer is just, it's not that simple. It's not that it gets any easier, it's that you get better. Doesn't get any easier. You get better. How do you progress in painting? That's what everyone wants to know. That's probably why you're watching this. Because I know you're not watching this for me. Um, you're watching this because you want to know how can I get better at painting? What can I do today? What can I do now to improve my painting? And let me tell you. If you think that I'm copying a master painting because it is so delightful and it's so fun and it's so original, what's going on with you? Um, no, this is about the hardest thing that I could be doing right now, doing a study of uh, not just any master, but a bougaro of a head that's turned. This is hard. And the way that you progress in painting, if you want to know the secret, there are many secrets and there shouldn't be any secrets, but uh, the, one of the biggest things that I can think of to help you improve your painting is to let go of the ego. Let go of your ego. Uh, your ego is probably the number one thing that's holding you back, is your ego. Uh, and even if you are one of those painters, uh, and we've all had days like this, where we lose confidence in ourselves, uh, and we just think, well, I'm not that good. I've only been painting for like six months. Um, you know that's also an ego uh, it's a lack of a lack of confidence type of ego but it is an ego what does the master study do uh, that helps you with the ego that is the fact that you're allowing history to educate and guide the present because if we don't understand history we are doomed to repeat what happened in the past doomed and my goodness i just you know i wish most of humanity knew this but uh, there's a lot of analogies excuse me uh in painting to real life there's a lot of analogies in many things that relate to real life and the fact is if you don't understand history you're doomed to repeat the past if you understand history, if you have a strong understanding of how Rembrandt, uh, not how he painted, I'm not trying to paint how Bouguereau painted, but if you find your own way in doing these studies, what's going to happen is what you learn here is going to transfer over to where it really counts. And that is when you are painting a model from life not just looking at a photo reference. 
A self-portrait. That's where it counts. Not when we're sitting there and we're doing a painting pixel by pixel rendering out a family picture that Aunt Susie took or whatever, like smiling, everyone's smiling and it's a good day and there's no light and shadows and come on now, we've all we've all done a painting like that. Don't sit there hiding. You've done a painting like that. And you regretted it, didn't you? Um so study the old masters. That's how you're gonna get good. Study them. Learn. Absorb what the old masters knew. And you're not going to learn what the old masters know by sitting there and trying to read textbooks about the materials that Rembrandt used, the method that he used, his teachers, the lineage, the secret art of the old master. That's not how it's going to happen. Uh, you're going to have to find your own way. You're going to have to have a solid understanding of the fundamentals and the fundamentals are pliable. You can start with color. You can start without color. You can start with lines. You can start with no lines. All methods meet somewhere in the middle and they definitely meet in the end. So don't waste your time thinking that learning the exact method that John Singer Sargent painted is going to make you a better painter because what's gonna make you a better painter is doing paintings on your own with the proper guidance of subject matter that the old masters painted. Oh, and I can go on and on about this because I've, I've been there. I am there. I'm still myself wondering how am I going to be better because I'm never, I'm never fully satisfied with my skill level. I'm always looking for, for greater heights. I'm always trying to paint better. By heights, I mean uh, having paintings that have more depth, more volume, and not photographic. Because if the purpose of your painting is to recreate perfectly uh, a photograph or perfectly recreate nature, you are doing the job of modern day technology. You've got robots that can do oil paintings now. We're living in a time where robots can do oil paintings. We've got 3D printers. Who knows what else we're going to have in the future. You see, the important thing is knowing the fundamentals and how to understand the basics and create your own voice. Take your own mind, take your own insights into the world. Use the power of painting and create something that has never been seen before. And I don't mean like in a conceptual, abstract kind of way. I mean paint anything you want, of course. I just want you to have a, a solid understanding. And that's not all going to come from one YouTube video, so if you are interested, and taking your education further with me, please check out the online classes. Also, there are many other uh, art instructors out there. But it is a good idea to find guidance. I was very lucky with my teachers. Now, in terms of the planes, it's not all that complicated. This is curving a little bit too much for my liking, so I'm going to flatten it out once I go in there. But this is lighter. This is not as light, but it's more pink. This is darker. This is lighter. This is pretty much the same as this. And uh, the lighter something is, uh, just like I spoke about in the underpainting, 
the closer the plane is to facing the light in a perpendicular angle. I really enjoy how uh, smooth this panel is. It is so smooth. If you're a health fanatic, please don't give me a lecture on drinking uh, Coke Zero or diet sodas or whatever. Or sodas in general. Because I know I should just be drinking water and tea. I know, I know. But we've all got our vices. And of course, this is the trade-off, really, because um, you're going to see me, you're going to see my body movements, which is a good thing, because I want you to see how often I move back, uh, but you're also going to just see my cluttered environment and um, stuff like that. If I'm drinking tea or water or whatever. Now we're putting in some of the values for the lips. I am thinning out the paint with solvent, just with Gamsol. These are um, Sable Brushes, Silver Brush brand, Silver Brush Pure Red Sable, size four, Pat's Tongue. Not made from cat's tongues. We got just about five minutes left. Now, clearly, I didn't go into the shadows, but that's okay. I'm letting the underpainting uh, do its thing and be the shadow shape, shadow color for now. 
almost made a mistake there. I was going to leave the lips way too dark. Red appears very dark as a value. And I'm just going to forget that the teeth are there for now. I'll paint that in later. But it also looks too dark because I don't have the darks surrounding it. So that's a problem. I'm going to have to do that actually now. I uh, don't want this to look funny. I mean, it's probably going to look funny, but I don't want to intentionally make it look funny. So if I can avoid that, I will. I always mention the awkward stage because I'm a very awkward person. Um, if you get to know me in person, um, I always mention the awkward stage. Every time you add something new to a painting, you add another awkward stage like that. Well, look at that. Now that we're adding the shadow. Didn't I just say a minute ago I was going to let this be the, the shadow? What am I doing? Anyway. Um, Every time you add something new, you introduce a new awkward stage. Period. That's just how it is. Um, there's no way of working around it. You introduce a new awkward stage. And what you need to do is accept it um, and work with it. The more you paint, the less the awkward stage is going to bother you, unless you're on camera. Uh, with uh, who knows how many people watching you and criticizing you. Um, so as long as you're not on camera all the time, the awkward stage won't bother you as much. If you're on camera frequently, good luck. I'm just trying to be real with you. I'm not trying to feed you any any uh, any lies. I'm nervous. I don't want this to look weird and then be bad for the thumbnail of this video. And I know I've only got like a minute forty five seconds, so uh, this is gonna be what the thumbnail is gonna look like. But it's okay. And that's another thing. Pressure. Pressure yourself sometimes. That's actually a good thing. It's sometimes good to have pressure when you're painting. Because then you actually do start to uh, do things differently. And you improve when you do something differently. And you realize, oh, that's what I should have been doing. Um... But don't worry, we're going to work on this painting many times. You will see this painting again. As you will see the other ones that I'm working on. So we did get a lot done, despite the ending being a little, a little strange. Um, the way that the lips ended up looking. I'm almost tempted to wipe that off, but it's alright. It's okay. Be careful not to unintentionally leave sharp edges around. And remember to paint lighter than you ultimately want to go. That's important. Edges and values. Don't paint things too dark because it's harder to... There goes the timer. So it is harder to layer. It's not impossible. And um, sometimes I, I don't really even think about this sometimes. But it's actually harder to layer over top of a darker painting than it is to layer over top of a lighter one. Because when this sinks in, um, 
when the painting dries, the darks will actually look like they faded in a little bit. So you'll notice that next time uh, we work on this. I'm just going to run the fan brush through the top, which will create some little streaks, but that's okay. I just want this to dry pretty flat. Look at that. Some of my Zoom students have already signed on. That means I gotta go. Alright, so I really hope that this YouTube video helps you out. If you are interested in taking your online art education with me further, please check out my online classes on patreon.com slash artist. Remember that the online classes start at just $10 a month. It gets you access to all the pre-recorded videos that are organized by projects that have their own individual playlists and allows you to send up to two images to me and here are the rules for that video um, so let me take the webcam out these are the rules for that video uh, the virtual classroom that comes out every Tuesday every Tuesday afternoon uh, and that's the ten dollars a month you're able to send uh, those uh, images to me weekly and then of course there are other uh, benefits such as a uh, behind the scenes video that you get um, also in that level. And I think those are all the benefits that I can think of. There is a monthly live chat using Zoom uh, the first Thursday of every month. But all that information is typed up for you in the Patreon page. I'm just letting you know the benefits that start out with the $10 a month. And then there's other tiers above the $10 a month if you're interested in that. Once again, um, thank you all so much for watching. There is the painting uh, without the distortion. That's what the painting looks like without the distortion. Uh, so again, thank you so much for watching. I wish you the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.